I was asked to talk about how to create x-rays and that in 30 minutes, which is of course nearly impossible. So I try to do it very superficially and visually, no formulas, just uh, hopefully some basic understanding. There are several ways of making radiation, but all ways of making radiation from charged particles comes from accelerating these particles. There's Bremsstrahlung, when, when particles get stopped, there's bent radiation, weakless and underlayers, radiation uh, from coherent radiation and microbunching. Um, there's even such synchrotron radiation out in space. So I'll try to talk about all these things. There are other very interesting effects, for example, FEL, free electron laser amplifiers, SASA free electron lasers, and Compton scattering sources. I won't find time for those. Now, uh, Cornell, I, I'm from Cornell, and of course Cornell is a very nice campus, as you see from this picture with a lake in the background, but it's also interesting for radiation because synchrotron radiation with respect to spectra and polarization was first experimentally characterized here in Cornell over in the basement of Newman Lab, somewhere back here, um, in the 50s. The Radiation uh, is known from antenna. If you have electrons moving up and down in an antenna, then they produce Hertz dipole radiation. And you might remember this characteristic uh, donut pattern. If the antenna is here and electrons get accelerated up and down the antenna, you get in the transverse plane this donut type radiation pattern. Interesting is that a DC current does not produce radiation. You know, from Maxwell equations, you have a current makes DC. Uh, fields, these magnetic fields, no radiation. So you do need acceleration of charges to get this radiation pattern. When you have it, just from symmetry reasons in all directions in the atoms of this donut, the same amount of photons per angle get radiated. Um, and uh, that's characterized by this kind of shell of photons that emanate outward. The next radiation pattern is the is what you get when you accelerate particles by stopping them on the material. You take electrons, hit them onto a material, stop them, very strong acceleration that gives the so-called Bremsstrahlung. So the electrons get accelerated strongly because they get uh, braked off, yeah, Bremsstrahlung, they get bremsed in turn, and radiate in the transverse direction. So if this is a medium, electrons get stopped, the, the X-ray radiation happens in this donut shape in the transverse direction, again, with astronomical symmetry. This radiation pattern is actually the most common radiation that's produced by accelerators, um, especially the many applications of accelerators in industry to a big extent use this Bremsstrahlung radiation. For example, X-raying of uh, ships or cargo or uh, trucks is done by X-rays that are produced Bremsstrahlung. Um, semiconductor fabrication is done uh, by uh, radiation, sometimes um, with Bremsstrahlung for the lithography, often more complicated processes. Bridge safety is uh, uh, radiating bridges again with radiation from Bremsstrahlung. In medicine, when you go to a doctor, you get your X-ray produced by Bremsstrahlung. So that's the most common way of producing radiation, I suppose. Unfortunately, it's also so common because often it is unwanted. Whenever an electron in any particle accelerator from a small electron microscope up to the large LHC, uh, well, in the LHC it's, it's not electrons, it's protons, but when a charged particle gets lost in the beam pipe, it produces lots of radiation and that's of course not wanted and dangerous. And so any accelerator needs to be carefully protected against these Bremsstrahlungs X-rays in the background. Now the next process is bent radiation again. It's the same source, accelerated charged particles radiate, but here we have a charged particle traveling quickly in a magnet, in a, in a dipole magnet and gets bent on a curve. The acceleration is transverse, so in the local rest frame, in the pro propagating rest frame, the acceleration goes to the center of the bending radius, and uh, in the rest frame you get this donut radiation. In the lab frame, you have to boost with the Lorentz transformation this donut pattern. And turns out that if the um, velocity is in this direction, you boost, then all the photons that go forward get length contracted. So they get strongly compressed. 
Not only that, they also increase the energy by the Doppler shift. So the two effects, which makes, make the forward direction much more intense, because all the photons get higher energy and get sque squeezed down. So in the forward direction, you get much more photon intensity. The pattern looks something like this. So you get a tightly bundled transformed donut that is all pointing in the forward direction. So what used to be a donut is boosted with this strong lobe in the forward direction. The opening angle is about one over gamma, where gamma is the relativistic gamma factor of the electron that is flying through the end. So you can tightly focus. If you have high energy, you can tightly focus uh, this, this radiation cone and uh, you can uh, make it very intense because the photon energy also goes up. Now, um, if you look at a bunch of particles going around a synchrotron, what actually happens is that they always radiate forward, but they also travel in a circle. So the radiation pattern actually looks more like the spiral if you would characterize it in time. The way to observe this pattern or to use it is that you uh, take this stored ring, this stored uh, beam that goes in a ring shape around the accelerator, and you build a mask with a hole so that this tight radiation cone with an open angle of one over gamma only comes through this hole for a short time, just when the opening cone passes this hole. From this, we can understand that the radiation will have a very short pulse, and the pulse will be given or characterized by this one over gamma opening angle. The smaller this opening angle is, the shorter the pulse that comes through this hole. And also, if the bend is very short, if the bend angle is shorter than one over gamma, then actually the pulse is also very short, just because the bend angle is so short. So there are two, two uh, characteristic radiation patterns. One is from a short bend, and one is from a long bend. In the long bend, the, the angle that goes through the hole is one over gamma. The other case, it's given by the angle of the bend itself. Now, if we know this length in time that this short pulse goes through the hole, we can use the uncertainty relation, delta omega times delta t is one, the uncertainty relation of frequency in, in time to calculate the characteristic frequency of this radiation. Um, it's not exactly just the given by the angle, the opening angle one over gamma that blinks through this hole, but additionally, we have to consider that while the photons travel, the electrons also travel and catch up with the photons and the pulse is shortened by the difference between the velocity and the speed of light. This gives an additional factor of one over gamma. So with the opening angle one over gamma compressed because the electrons fly and catch up or you know, fly past the photons compressed by one over V minus one over C, which is proportional to one over gamma squared. So the frequency, the time, the shortness of the pulse is one over gamma cubed. The frequency that characterizes the radiation therefore must be proportional to to gamma cubed itself. And dimensional analysis of anything that plays a, can play a role here, rho and c means that the delta omega must be c over rho times gamma cubed times some factor. It turns out that the center of the distribution is three half of this factor. So very simply by knowing the length of the pulse, you know what the typical frequency will be. If you plot the frequency, so, so the power density um, over the frequency, you see that indeed, um, you have this characteristic radiation that goes with gamma to the power of three that splits the power in the spectrum in two, half right, half left. And uh, there's a peak somewhat below. You can also characterize that it uh, rises with omega to the one third power initially and then it falls off. And of course, at very high energy, you can never have a photon. No photon can have more energy than the electron itself. So that's what happens in the bend. Uh, light sources usually don't use bend radiation itself. They use a storage ring, which has many bend angles that guide the electrons in a circular orbit. But between the bends, there are undulators that enhance the radiation. And the way that works is that an undulator or a wiggler has many little bends so that in every bend you get this one over gamma open cone shooting out the undulator and you add many of these cones together in every little bend to get the radiation enhanced. 
weakless and undulators are different. Often, the, often storage rings have weakless as well as undulators, so it's important to know what they are. Um, here, this is about how they look like. You have a very stable arrangement where you have magnets, north and south poles alternating, north and south poles, so the electron that flies through undulates back and forth in the sinusoidal orbits. You can make the field stronger by reducing the gap, so you can control the shape of these orbits. Um, every bend makes this one over gamma cone, and the many one over gamma cones can add up. Now, what's the difference between weaklers and undulators? The difference is very simple. If the sinusoidal orbit has a slope going up and slope going down that deviates an angle by more than one over gamma, then the one over gamma cone does not always point forward. You see the one over gamma cone points forward and then it misses the observer because it goes to the side. It misses the observer, points forward again. So you will see in a wiggler that the radiation turns on and off, turns on and off, turns on and off because the angle is so large that the forward observer is not hit by the one over gamma cone. In an undulator, the sinusoid is narrower, doesn't, doesn't wiggle up and down as much. So the one over gamma cone always hits the observer and therefore the radiation pattern is much longer. Longer radiation pattern, delta T big, means delta omega small. So an undulator has a much narrower spectrum. So we say narrow band undulators and wide band wigglers. And because white starts with a W, you can remember white band is for the wiggler. So you never confuse those again. Now, um, which radiation frequencies does an undulator uh, produce? It turns out that the undulator is so narrow because only for very specific frequencies does the radiation of every bend coherently add up in forward direction. And it's that frequency where an electron that happens to, in the first bend, move upward produces a certain radiation field. After half, of, half an oscillation, it points downward and of course, by symmetry, produce exactly the same radiation field, only with a negative sign. And only when the travel time of the light in this wave is faster than the average longitudinal velocity of the electron, so that this faster speed makes the light pattern propagate exactly half a wavelength, only then can the radiation from here and here coherently overlap. So that means that the average velocity has to be, um, has to produce a half wavelength slip with the speed of light. And that's why we get another factor of gamma squared. One over the average velocity minus one is a factor of one in proportion to gamma squared. So the uh, radiation pattern is not, does not have the wavelength of the undulator. It has the wavelength of the undulator roughly speaking divided by gamma squared. So you get much higher energies. Um, the radiation also has an angular dependence because while the radiation, the photons in the radiation have to slip this half wavelength over one half electron oscillation, at an angle they have to slip less. They have to slip less by the cosine because that length is only the cosine of the full uh, wavelength. So therefore the um, lambda is changed by the angle. So there's an angular dependence of the radiation and that can be all observed. Here's an example. Let's see. Hmm. That's a shame. That's supposed to play. Hmm. See, it's kind of nice. Let me see if I can show you the. If I can show you the video. This is a video that was produced at the free electron laser at JLab, where the undulator gap is opened and closed. You see here the micrometer screw have the open close the undulator, and they scan the resonance frequency through the different colors of visual light. So you see indeed the shape of the sinusoidal orbit determines which light frequency, which color gets enhanced in the undulator. And you also see that there's an angular dependence. So for example, the inner, inner cone already gets yellow before the outside, when the outside is still green. So you see an angular dependence of the color that is enhanced as well, following exactly the formulas 
Um, so if I look at the radiation pattern of a band as a function of frequency, uh, sorry, as a function of energy or frequency of the photons and angle, I see that I radiate most in forward direction. This shape is exactly the frequency distribution that I showed you before, the frequency distribution of the photons in forward direction at an, at an angle, the frequencies go down. So the energy of the photons go down, the peak goes down if I open up in, in angle. Also the, the, the frequency gets narrow. So if I, so that's the same pattern pointing forward in the band radiation. Um, the peak in forward direction has a certain fre characteristic frequency and the frequency goes down with an angle. In an underlayer, I have this enhancing formula the, the spectrum gets very narrow. Here's this narrow spectrum, but also the angular dependence is still there. So the frequency, this narrow frequency goes down, lower energy for the photons at an opening angle of the underlayer. And there are higher harmonics that I will say, say something in a minute about. Um, so this angular frequency is important. It gives rise to something that I call the, the umbrella of n-pole underlayer radiation. The umbrella because we get a photon energy that is a function of the opening angle of the radiation coming out of the underlayer. So if the radiation goes forward, we get certain photon energies. If I look a little bit to the right, I get different photo photon frequencies. And that gives rise to a very intense forward cone of monochromatic radiation. Because I can cut out just this forward peak and I get very well collimated well collimated uh, radiation. If I could just cut out this forward energy window, I get the characteristic energy spread that's very narrow because of the narrow bandwidth of the underlayer. And by monochromating, I cut out angles and I get a very tightly focused forward beam. I can learn a few things about it. So just because the delta t, the, the time goes proportional to the number of poles in the underlayer, therefore for the frequency goes with one over, the frequency width goes with one over the number of poles, more poles, narrow frequency width. Uh, to get, one needs to get the number of photons proportional to n, you know, n times the photons, the n times the poles, you get n times the photons. So the peak has to go up with n squared. That's also important. So you get very intense radiation with n squared. Uh, the width, if the, if the width in energy is one over n, then the angular width of this quadratic cone quadratic shape is one over square root n. So I can get a very well collimated cone that gets narrow and narrow with one over square root of the number of poles. Uh, the beam properties disturb this a little bit. For example, if you have an energy spread of the beam, so different electrons have different energies, then this umbrella of radiation is spread out in energy and therefore it is wider than the one over n that we want and therefore also the, the collimation. Um, is not working as well and the beam gets not as narrow. So we want to have the energy spread smaller than the scaling of one over n with underlayer poles. If you make n too large then la so that one over n is gets smaller than the energy spread then you don't benefit from the underlayer anymore. Then an additional uh, problem with beam properties is the divergence. So this angular characteristic happens for every electron. So if an electron comes into the underlayer with an angle, with a divergence angle in the beam, then this angular distribution is shifted to the right or to the left. So the angular distribution of electrons in the beam spread out this umbrella of radiation right and left, and therefore energy collimation does not make the beam as narrow as you want anymore. So you want the divergence of the beam smaller than the one over gamma of the radiation that goes down additionally by this one over square root of n of the width that you get from collimation, from collimation. So you want to have the width that comes, that you can get from collimation not be diluted by the divergence of the beam. So that would be ideal if you could get the divergence of the beam that small. Um, additionally, you want to have the spot size small. It turns out that the spot size that has a diffraction pattern um, uh, with for, for a wavelength lambda would be lambda divided by the divergence. So you want to have the spot size smaller than that. Otherwise the spot is larger 
then uh, the diffract that then a spot that would produce uh, the desired divergence by diffraction. So you wonder if the spot's smaller than this diffraction pattern. So that together gives you the following rule that the best is if you manage to get the energy spread smaller than one over n, the divergence smaller than this one over square root of n, and the emittance divergence times spot size smaller than the wavelength, rough scaling, then you take full advantage of the underlayer. So this uh, umbrella of underlayer radiation, I find quite useful to remember the scaling rules. I told you that I would say something about the higher harmonics. The radiation of a sinusoidal antenna with that where the sinusoidal oscillates up and down with frequency omega, that radiation will be exactly omega. There are no other frequencies. Similarly, if you have an underlayer that produces <clears throat> that produces a perfect sinusoidal orbit, for example, in the helical underlayer, where you can get a perfect uh, circular rotation of the beam, perfect sinusoidal orbit, if the field is perfectly shaped, then you would get exactly one frequency. In a real underlayer, that is not correct because while the electrons oscillate, even if it were a sinusoidal orbit, first, there are two reasons why we get higher harmonics. One is the orbit is not perfectly sinusoidal because the magnetic field is produced by rectangular poles, which don't have a sinusoidal pattern. So in the first place, we don't have a sinusoidal uh, oscillation. Um, we therefore have to Fourier, make a Fourier series of this non-sinusoidal periodic orbit, and that gets higher harmonics. But the more important effect is that the, the longitudinal velocity of the electron changes. The longitudinal velocity of the electron is the full velocity up here, but it, because the electron has an angle, the longitudinal velocity is slower. So the electron spends shorter time, here I'm plotting the time, the, the electron orbit versus time, the electron spends shorter time at the peak of the oscillation and spends longer when it crosses the um, the and later. And so you get a pattern that is very not sinusoidal, which has to be fully transformed. And that gives all the higher harmonics of the underlayer radiation. So uh, that's all I want to say about processes in underlayers. There is a very interesting effect that we get when beams are very short. The reason is that if a bunch is shorter than the wavelength of radiation, then every electron that gets bent in a bending magnet produces the same radiation pattern shifted by less than a wavelength. So this radiation pattern of all the electrons in the bunch can coherently interact. The electric field is then proportional to the number of particles in the bunch so that the power is proportional to number of particles squared. A typical bunch has a billion particles. So a billion squared is a huge number. If the bunch is too long, then the fields don't add up coherently, then just the power sums up. So every electron radiates a certain power and the total power goes with n so that the field um, is stochastic and would on average go with square root of n. So the, the power of singleton radiation for an n particle bunch, therefore, in the short frequency limit, where the wavelength is shorter than the bunch, we get just n times the radiation pattern that I showed you before. But for long wavelength at low frequencies, we get an enhancement by the number of particles because here the bunch is shorter than the wavelength. So the radiation pattern for a real bunch actually looks like this. There's coherent singleton radiation enhancement by a huge factor, like 10 to the 8, 10 to the 9 could be in principle, if you have so many particles in your bunch strong enhancement, and then the intensity goes down to the long wavelengths. This is nice because you can get a lot of radiation, but it can also be bad because this intense radiation can damage the beam. Let me show you how this works. It's called the micro-bunching instability. So if the bunch is very short, it emits very intense radiation in the long wavelengths region. And the radiation from the back of the bunch is faster than the bunch itself. Sorry, the, the, the radiation is faster than the bunch itself. So it can catch up with the bunch and can the radiation can, can hit the bunch itself. Um, and so here the radiation from the back can hit the front of the bunch. 
because it has to travel a longer distance from the back to the front. So it can catch up with the front and damage the front. It can then produce a micro bunching pattern in the bunch. Now, that micro bunching pattern has a region where it is short, where the bunch exclusion is shorter than the wavelengths, so that it radiates even stronger than the initial radiation, bunches the beam even more making even more radiation and you get an exponential growth of this coherent singleton radiation and that damages the bunch, the bunch distribution a lot. That has been measured. Here's an old measurement where you can actually very nicely see the sub bunching in the electron distribution. Uh, just recently we've measured that at a Cornell accelerator as well. So it's, it's a very interesting effect to observe and to look how it scales with the, with the bunch intensity. Uh, the, this has been simulated quite nicely in a collaboration with astrophysics, where you see uh, a beam going around um, a circular magnetic field pattern in a star, and this micro-bunching instability produces this, this intensity, bunch intensity distribution of electrons. Why is that relevant? It's relevant because the synchrotron radiation that I've been talking about today is, to my knowledge, the only science word from accelerator physics that has made it into the mainstream of astrophysics. In, uh, out in space, there is synchrotron radiation because one, one effect is that electrons get bent strongly, high energy electrons that get emitted from, by, for example, from pulsars um, can have very high intensity and they're extremely strong magnetic fields so they can get bent and emit synchrotron radiation. Synchrotron radiation is characterized with respect to other radiation that it is very broadband. It's a very broadband radiation compared to atomic radiation where you get atomic transitions and you can actually see from the radiation pattern which atoms make the radiation. So single radiation is much broader than that. So if you look, for example, at the first observed synchrotron ever, it's the Crab Nebula. And on the 1st of July, it was observed in China in around 1054. Yeah, it was visible for a month at daytime. For two years, it was visible at night. And people say it is the largest 4th of July firework ever. This uh, radiation pattern, you can still observe it today. It, it has uh, strong lines from atomic radiation in the hydrogen and oxygen region. But it also has a very broad spectrum. Where does it come from? From the singleton radiation. Um, if you measure the spectrum, you see that the distribution looks just like you would expect from singleton radiation, the characteristic distribution of singleton radiation. It's not clear, however, how so much singleton radiation intensity could be produced. Where do all the electrons come from that can produce that amount of radiation that we observe here? One explanation can be that, um, that the electrons see this coherent singleton radiation micro-bunching instability so that the radiation gets enhanced by this huge factor of n. And then, of course, much more reasonable, much less, much fewer electrons are needed to produce the radiation pattern that is observed on Earth. So that's our accelerator in space with which I wanted to conclude this presentation. And I'm open for your questions. Hi, Georg, can I ask a quick question? Sure. So in a real synchrotron, can you comment on the efficiency of turning the electricity that goes into, say, driving chess into radiation? What, what percentage of the radiation loss accounts for the electricity use in chess? Um, very little. So the, the radiation in a typical storage ring in the typical electron storage ring, you lose about, um, I mean, it depends on the accelerator, but you, you lose about a fraction of a percent, to three per mil is a typical number, of the energy in every turn. So, um, and only a small fraction of, the, because you, need, you radiate in every bending magnet. Mm -hmm. And um, only a fraction of that goes into undulators and only a much smaller fraction of that goes through the monochromators. So heating, heating of the beam pipe components is a, is a big problem 
in synchrotrons because you, the useful photons are usually only a small fraction of what you actually produce. So what I was talking about, all of the photons. So not just the ones that you use. I realize that's a small amount, but the heating of the beam pipe, isn't that coming from- Oh yeah, no, that, that, is, that is about, that's, that is typically a fraction of a percent. So in the largest, to my knowledge, the largest synchrotron, the, the largest number in a, in a big synchrotron that was produced was the lab accelerator at CERN. It had, at the end, it had 3% loss per turn. So, so just to keep it at 105 GeV at the time, you needed to spend 3% of the electron's energy every single turn to keep it at that energy. So because of that, the complete accelerator, wherever you could, was filled with accelerating cavities. Thanks. And the power needs get enormous. There is this, um, the FCC, the Future Circular Collider for Electrons and Positrons, that's proposed um, has a total power load of something like 100 or 200 megawatt, just from radiation. The, the electron ring for the electron ion collider that's currently built at Brookhaven is limited to 10 megawatt just, by, just for radiation. 